Hey, what's happening, everybody? Welcome to Every Nation Bryanson YouTube uh, channel. My name is Sevilla Narche, and as always, it is a profound privilege to spend about an hour with you sharing the word so that you might know God and make him known. Hey, if you are popping in very first time, maybe a friend shared you the link or family member, do us a favor, click on our connection card under this video. Let us know where you are, where you're from, who you are, and would love an opportunity to connect with you and also find ways to connect you to our spiritual family. In fact, if you don't know, we actually meet on Sundays physically, 8.30, 10.30, and 5 p.m. service every Sunday at our Every Nation Bryanston venue. I hope to see you there, but until then, fill out the connection card so we might find a way to connect with you. Hey, uh, we are jumping straight to the message this Sunday, our uh, week three of a Amandla series. I hope it's been helpful for you, encouraging to you, and particularly if you are in a group, I hope it's been inspiring you to connect deeper, not only with other people, but to consider deeply uh, where we are as a people, where we are as a nation, and how you can get involved. So if you're not in a group, click on the links provided below. Let us know uh, how we can help you to get involved in a connect group. This series really needs you to be with other believers thinking deeply about what it means to have power and use power in our beautiful nation. So without further ado, time for week three of our Mandla series, take out your Bibles and your notepads. Let's get to work. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be at verse 43 to 48. But as you turn there, I, I kind of want to set up this moment, kind of putting a summary of the last few weeks together, but also to set up uh, not only the title of this message, but also the text of this message. Um, when you consider Genesis 1 and 2, we are reminded again of this amazing creator God who utilizes his power to take the chaos that is in the world and turn it into beauty, order, so that life might actually flourish. The way we see power being used in Genesis 1 and 2, it is turning chaotic situations into beautiful, ordered situations that allow people to thrive. But not only that, we see not only the usage of power to create from chaos to beauty, but we also see power being shared. God creates image bearers. He creates idols, uh, human beings made in his image, and he shares power with them. And he begins to call them to take from the raw material of the world and create, create for the glory of God and for the good of mankind. It's worth noting that even as we have recently heard, as recent as this morning, that on the 29th of May will be our official voting day, it is worthwhile for us to note that um, Voting is the use of power. We're taking the raw materials of the world and we are, we are creating, we are choosing to use our power for the good of all and for the glory of God. And so as we vote, part of what we are doing is that we are allowing ourselves to access that which has been made available for us in our context and in our nation. And we are going to vote and use that power in a way that we hope will actually bring flourishing to our nation. And so we don't just tick a box, but we begin to evaluate different manifestos. We begin to evaluate the values of different parties and leaders to try and figure out what will come closest to glorifying God and flourishing for other human beings. There is no party 
I believe, that uh, can fully encompass all that we are trying to see from the kingdom. But we can utilize our power in the right way. It is worth noting, though, that if the only way we think of how we use our power for human flourishing, if the only act of justice that we choose to take part of is voting, there's a problem with that. We do that once every couple of years. And, and if the only way we actually engage in good deeds and justice and making things right is by ticking a box, we have completely missed what the Bible teaches us about justice. So uh, he, here we are in, in Genesis 1 and 2. God creates from the chaotic into the beautiful and the ordered, but he also shares power with his image bearers and they begin to take the raw material of the world and begin to create and begin to make and, and begin to allow flourishing to happen. But there, soon after Genesis 3, sin comes into the world. Man begins to choose to live outside the definitions uh, that God has given regarding what is good and what is evil. And man has chosen to live autonomously from God. But in so doing, they begin to use their power the wrong way. We see power being misused in marriage, where the husband and the wife begin to use their power to blame the other person. We see power being, being misused in the context of family where a brother kills another brother. Why? Because they feel jealous. We see this moving not only from individuals, but now into communities and eventually cities. And this is where the, the idea of politica, politics, comes into play. How are humans going to orientate a system of good and evil within the context of a society, a city, a nation, a people. This climaxes all the way to Exodus 1 and 2. Remember, we spoke about Genesis 1 and 2, the proper use of power. And now here we are in Exodus 1 and 2, and we have the epitome of the misuse of power, where we're gonna find a Pharaoh who plays God the wrong way. And what this Pharaoh does, he, he, he has this power, but is not righteous. He is in no way connected to the God, the creator God of Genesis 1. And in fact, we are told that he doesn't even know who that creator God is. And the way that he begins to uh, engage in justice is so terrible that he actually engages in justice out of fear. So here's what he does. He hears and sees that the Israelites are growing in number and out of fear, the way that he utilizes his power, this Pharaoh, he holds power for his own people. He, he holds power for his own people. And the way he begins to exercise power towards others is that he begins to perceive others as enemies. He begins to perceive others as a threat to his own national security. And so the way he uses power towards those who are his enemies, he oppresses them. He creates a politica, a system of good and evil. And this system of good and evil is actually the, one's own personal and, and, and tribal understanding. It, it, it's, it's for their own personal and tribal interest. The whole system is to protect the Egyptians and to oppress the Israelites. He begins to uh, enslave them. He begins to discourage them and begins to kill the next generation. This should be a grave warning to us about how we use our power based on the perception we have of threat and the perceptions we have of what others are to us. 
It's so terrible that in the killing of infants and children, God in his sovereign grace actually has to um, rescue Moses, this young infant, rescue Moses through the bravery of women, midwives. And uh, the women in the uh, in Pharaoh's household who actually take Moses in, and this young boy who has been rescued is now going to grow up to ultimately be the rescuer of the people of God. Uh, uh, it's interesting then that in Matthew one and two we are introduced to another king-like, pharaoh-like figure in Herod. He also is beginning in Matthew 1 and 2 to annihilate children because he's, he's perceived a threat that there is a king coming greater than him. But God sovereignly rescues and protects Jesus, who ultimately grows up and as we discovered last week, declares to everyone who would listen, the kingdom of God is at hand. You see, the whole story of the Old Testament partly reflects that what God had desired of his image bearers is that they would bring about righteousness and justice in the world. But instead, we find in Isaiah chapter 1 that instead what these humans have done, these humans with power have created, are nations filled with tears. This is why today's sermon is titled, Cry, the Beloved Country. Jesus, therefore, arises and he declares that the kingdom of God is at hand. What is his fundamental good message? Good news is simply this. There's a new king in town. In May 29, we are going to have people declaring that a new king has risen in South Africa. For some of us, that would be good news. For some of us, that will be bad news, depending on who the king is. But, but, but what the kingdom of God does, what, what Christianity and the Bible teaches you is that regardless of what happens on May 29, we must be grounded in a biblical story that allows us to live life knowing that we already have a king and we are utilizing all our power for the sake of righteousness and justice. And, and we, we are so confident in the fact that this king is righteous in all that he does. And he's going to give us power for the now, but he's also going to exercise ultimate power in a season to come where all things will be made right. There won't be any more tears and we'll finally inherit the earth that he has created. I want to give you a quick example. I was thinking about this this week around a picture of what the kingdom is at hand looks like. Picture for, with me for a moment. Uh, two parents. Uh, uh, parents of a particular child or children. And before their children are born, they put a whole bunch of money in an investment account. And the way this investment account is built up is that only when uh, their children come into maturity can they begin to access, particularly in the beginning, the dividends that comes from that investment. But the full payout will only come later. And so these children grow up and the eldest child finally comes of maturity. And now the, the dividends of that account that investment have been made available. So Jesus is the maturing of humanity. With his uh, um, introduction and appearing into the world, humanity finds maturity in Christ Jesus. And because Jesus has come into the world, dividends has been released into the world. Now we have access to uh, realities that we didn't have because of an investment that our father has made before the creations of the world. 
Um, and now we can access means of the kingdom. We can pray for the sick and see them healed. We can trust God and actually have his presence near us continuously. We can walk in this world with a sense of confidence that a new king is right here, reordering, reshaping, and that we can actually see justice and righteousness being implemented in the world. And yet, we have not received the full payout of the investment yet. We are living in the dividends, but the full payout will come on Judgment Day. And so what this means, we have access to the realities of the kingdom, but we are also li living out that access in the midst of continual brokenness, pain, mourning, suffering. We are losing loved ones. We are burying friends. We are seeing and mourning the injustices in the world, the corruption, the hatred, the bitterness. But what those who are called to be followers of the way have to live is that they have to live knowing that the dividends has come. The kingdom is already here. And so they, they trust, they faith, their disposition is fully acknowledging the realities of this world whilst yet fully accessing the realities of this new kingdom that has come. And so it's with this in mind that Jesus declares this message and he says, those who are the first responders, those who are the first receivers of this kingdom are those who have been ostracized and maligned by society and I've called them to myself and I'm saying, here is the kingdom, you who are the spiritual zeros, you who keep seeing the reality of all that's broken in the world and yet you're not distracting yourself with wealth and means. You're allowing yourself to go, there's something not right in the world and we need righteousness and justice to fix it. To you, I bless you with my presence. To you, I bless you with my kingdom. To you who are spiritually bankrupt of all the things of this world and you know and recognize your need for this kind of king, this kind of Messiah, to you, I give myself. The kingdom is at hand. So Jesus teaches the Beatitudes, but then walks into uh, uh, the full Sermon of the Mount, of which the Beatitudes is like this beautiful, profound intro to. And in his teaching, he's reorientating these people to have a consciousness, a kingdom-like consciousness. And one of the things he teaches them, which I would argue is one of the hardest teachings of Jesus, he teaches them what it means to be people of the kingdom who treat people who are on the outside, who treat people who seem like a threat or treat people who hate them and maybe they hate as well. He, he's going to teach them that there is a way that you need to engage your enemies. We, we are not going to engage our enemies like Pharaoh who used his power to hoard all the power just for his own tribe and rather oppress perceived threats, but oppressed the Israelites. But we're going to use our power differently. The question in today's sermon is, how do you use your power towards your enemies? And it... What does the kingdom teach us about how we ought to see our enemies and treat our enemies? Matthew 5, verse 43 to 48. You have heard it said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? 
And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles or pagans do exactly the same. You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Lord, help us today as we study your word. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When you perceive that you have an enemy, I want to suggest to you that what the Bible encourages us to do as a way of seeing them, but also using our power toward them, is that it points us to four things that we need to do when we seemingly have an enemy. Number one, we need to read the scriptures. Number two, we need to evaluate our cheeks. Number three, we need to consider the weather. And number four, we need to observe our enemies. Um, Matthew 5 is not an easy text. This particular portion about loving your enemies is a hard one to swallow. Because all of us know what it's like to have people who dislike us. In fact, if we had to be honest, we all know what it's like to have people that we hate. When we see them, our blood just boils up. When, we, so when someone talks about them, we are so quick to uh, look the other way. We're so easily irritable. But Jesus wants us to consider how we treat these kind of people. But in so doing, uh, he actually points to a text uh, in the, the text we just read now. He, he points to an originating text because the concept of loving your neighbor is profoundly spread throughout the Bible. In fact, when Jesus is teaching those who are listening to him about this idea of love, he's actually quoting from Leviticus 19. 15 to 18. Here's what it says. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. But in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You, you shall not go around as a slanderer among your people and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor for I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against your sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself, for I am the Lord. All right, in this particular text, who is our neighbor? The neighbor seems to be, according to these scriptures, uh, that the, the Israelites' neighbor are actually Israelites. People of their own tribe, people of their own kinsmen, people of uh, uh, brothers and sisters within their own tribe. But, but if, you, if you read further on in Leviticus 19, it, it ups the ante a little bit. Leviticus 19, 33 to 34 says this, when a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So, number one, we are meant to love our brothers. The Israelites are meant to love other Israelites as they love themselves. But uh, the, the scriptures up the ante and what we hear is that we are also meant to love foreigners. Like their native borns, we are also meant to love them like we love ourselves. And, 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 and the scriptures puts a caveat here that the way we're going to love foreigners is that we, we need to, the place in which we're going to get motivation to love our foreigners is that we need to remember that we were foreigners, that we were once in Egypt. And if you recognize that, then you will humbly walk before the Lord in the way that you love foreigners. But notice for a moment, we, we understand that we are meant to love our neighbor. And in this particular moment, the neighbor are those who are in our tribe, who believe like us, who look like us, who sound like us. 
But furthermore, we are also meant to love those who are foreigners, those who are just outside our tribe, but now have kind of moved in to our spatial space, right? Have moved into our environmental space as foreigners. We are also meant to treat them with love and care as if they are our own kinsmen, as if they are our own family as well. So here's the problem with this text. Where is the command that we should hate our enemy? Where is it? Because it's nowhere in this scripture, nor is it anywhere in the Old Testament. Yes, there are moments where there's judgment that takes place over particular uh, um, uh, tribes or, or nations, but nowhere are we explicitly commanded to hate our enemies. What happened? Uh, notice in Matthew 5, Jesus says this. He doesn't say, you have read it that you should hate your enemies. He says, you've heard it said. that This is something you've heard in your culture, that you must hate your enemies. What happens is that the, the, the scriptures seem to point to a reality where the Jewish people or Jewish leaders of the time took a scripture that told them to love their neighbor, to love one another and to love the foreigner and began to assume that it also means to love one is to hate another. They began to fill the empty spaces of the scripture with assumptions. How many times do we do that? We read a portion of scripture and then we consider the silent part of the scripture seemingly uh, as saying something loud. That yes, love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. And that would also be a problem because throughout the scriptures, God seems to be inviting foreigners and God seems to be inviting uh, uh, other nations to actually follow him. And where do we get this from? In Genesis 12, God says to Abraham, I'm actually blessing you, not just for your own people and your own tribe. I'm actually blessing you that you will be a blessing to all nations. Why? Because he desires that all nations will finally come to his presence. There is a danger when we begin to infer upon scripture, when we begin to create in our culture a messaging that is actually not in the scripture, when we begin to stop reading the scriptures and we begin to adding our own things upon the scripture, like these seemingly well-meaning Jewish people and possibly Jewish leaders who are adding to the scriptures an idea that is in contrary to the scriptures. This weird concept that somehow the enemies of God have become our enemies and our enemies have become the enemies of God. Therefore, the way we treat God's enemies is that we hate them and the way God treats our enemies is that he hates them too. And so uh, you have to bear in mind that the Israelites at this time have many possible people that could be their enemies. They've been oppressed for 600 years. They know what it's like to be oppressed by the Assyrians, by the Babylonians, by the Persians, and now by the Roman Empire. They have a lot of hatred to go around. And yet the scriptures call us to a different way of thinking. So number one, when you have an enemy, you need to read the scriptures correctly. But number two, when you seemingly have an enemy, you have to evaluate your cheeks. Now, in Luke chapter six, the same uh, kind of concept and, 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 and story of Jesus teaching the Beatitudes and Sermon on the Mount is shared, but through the lens of Dr. Luke. And he adds a phrase in here that is very common and very popular to us. And I want to kind of touch on it a little bit. And here's where it is in Luke 6, verse 27 to 31. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other cheek also. And from the one who takes your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. 
Give to everyone who begs from you and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. All right, so because of time, I want to look at this one particular concept, and I believe the, the opening up of this concept will allow you to understand uh, this particular scripture. What does it mean for us to turn the other cheek? Uh, more often than not, this scripture is used as a way of kind of encouraging that we as Christians and people of the kingdom, because of our faith in Jesus, we kind of just take it. When people do things to us, we, we simply just take it and move on. Uh, we don't stand up against anything. We, we have hope in Jesus, and so we just take it. And I think it's been partly this kind of teaching that has led people to live in the world uninvolved. They're kind of just waiting for a rainy day to happen where everything will be made right, and they're not actively doing anything. They're not actively involved in acts of justice. This is the furthest thing from this text. There is no culture in the world. I'm trying to paint this picture for you. Imagine with me that I'm standing in front of another man equal to me. And this individual, most likely, given the context in which this was written, uses a backhand and they slap my face, right? Now, if you're trying to knock someone out, you aim for the jaw, maybe the nose, maybe uh, uh, kind of the, um, the, the top of the head, right? To aim for the cheek, you're not trying to necessarily um, assault somebody or assault somebody's safety. To, to give a backhand to the cheek, cheek is the idea is that you are dishonoring someone. You're embarrassing somebody. You are shaming somebody. Now, watch this. If, if somebody was standing in front of me and they slapped me on my cheek, and the moment they slapped me on my cheek, I begin to stand up straight and turn the other cheek. There is no culture in the world that would call that weakness. None. The idea that somehow to turn the other cheek uh, socially is to kind of like just be a walkover, let people just walk all over you. That is not what the scriptures are saying. And so if that's not what the scripture is saying, what is it saying? And to, to understand this, I need to point you to this scripture in Micah. Micah 6 verse 8. It's a very famous scripture particularly to those who, 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 who are trying to express the importance of justice in the world. But sometimes we can miss a part of this text. So see what it says, Micah 6 verse 8. He has told you, O man, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Off the bat, what you notice is this, is that to do justice, the idea that you let people walk all over you, the idea that you let anyone just do whatever they want is completely contrary to what the Bible calls you to do. We have to, we must, we are called to do justice, to make things right. But we're also called to love, kindness. And sometimes we, we want to we wanna choose one over the other. We want to declare that one exists without the other. But the Bible is saying that here's what's good. You need all these three present. You need justice, a love for kindness. You need to do justice, have a love for kindness, and walk humbly with God. All these three must be present when we're engaging our enemies. And so, uh, in order now to understand this whole idea of turning the other cheek, with this scripture at the backdrop, here's what we, we need to understand. If somebody slaps me on the cheek, I need to ensure that they don't keep slapping me. Because I need to ensure that justice is done. 
But I also need to ensure that I don't slap them back. Why? Because I have loved kindness. And, 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 and what, what tends to be the extreme of interpreting the scripture or misinterpreting the scripture is that we can either become passive where we just keep allowing people to slap us in the same cheek all the time or we become vindictive where we slap somebody back and, and, and here's what we learn about the reality of retaliation, even in the scripture before this, in Matthew 5, verse 38 to 42, where, where Jesus says, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, right? Uh, the, the problem in the culture was that if somebody had to take out my eye, the way I would retaliate, I would try and take out their eye and their ear. Because something in all of us, uh, when we respond out of justice, sometimes we don't respond with equality. We don't respond with fairness. Something in us wants to not only do what has been done with us, but we want to leave a mark on the other person as well. But the only way you can become a person of the kingdom who learns how to love your enemies is that you need to do justice while it's tensioned with loving kindness. And all of this happens as we are living, walking humbly with God, not being prideful, not thinking that we have the solution, not thinking that we have the way, not, not thinking that uh, our way is better than God's way, not thinking that our way is better than anyone else's way, but we living in this tension of in our humility before God, we are holding loving kindness and justice. So the idea of turn the other cheek is not so that the other person might hit you again. To turn the other cheek can, can be interpreted in two ways. If somebody slaps me on this cheek, kind of trying to shame me or bringing dishonor, I must have the kind of fortitude in my life where I'm not so interested in protecting my ego that I need to slip them back so that I embarrass them, right? I need to allow my identity to be, to be found in Christ. And so now I make sure that they, they're not hitting me again on the same cheek. But to turn the other cheek, number one, is to allow the other person, instead of slapping you to embarrass you, is to give the other person the opportunity to open up their hand and treat you like an equal. Don't... don't don't slap me as if you are superior than me. Know that we are equals. If you're going to hit me on the other cheek, you have to do it with an open hand because we are equals. But beyond that, what we see is that the idea of opening the other cheek is to not just provoke equality, but it's also to invite reconciliation. This cheek has been hurt but this cheek has not. And I wanna invite you to act differently. I wanna give you an opportunity to choose something different than your violence, to choose something different than your hatred, to choose something that allows us to be reconciled together. To turn the other cheek is not weakness, it's a strength that can only be found when we live in the tension of doing justice and loving kindness whilst being humble before the Lord. Um, not only are we called to evaluate our cheeks, we are called to consider the weather. In Matthew 5, it's interesting. Um, Jesus says, hey, listen, um, you need to not only love your neighbor, but you need to love your enemies, but also pray for those who persecute you. And then he points to something interesting. He, he, he points to the fact that when we do this, we are people who are like acting like our father. 
Um, this, this scripture is not giving a prerequisite that if you don't love your enemies, you're not saved. No, uh, what it's pointing to, this idea that we are sons of the Father, is that when we begin to love our enemies, we are beginning to act like our Father would act. And then he gives an example about the weather. He's, he says, here's how the Father acts. He lets the sun rise on the evil and the good. He also lets the rain come down on both the just and the unjust. Um, the father is not oblivious to the corruption in the world. He's not oblivious to the evil in the world. But yet every single day, whether there's a good farmer or a corrupt farmer, they both experience the sun rising up every day to come and shed light on their crops. They both experience the rain falling down every day to come and water their crops. And we are meant to realize that this is the nature of the Father. He's merciful. Uh, he's not weak. He's not blind. But he knows that when all is said and done, there will be a judgment day that will allow the completeness of the judgment that God gives will allow all things to be made right. But yet every single day, God is so merciful, God is so kind that he actually allows people to get what they don't deserve. This can be such a tough concept for all of us. Because right now, if you're watching this, what tends to happen is that we are thinking of our enemy and how the idea of having mercy or loving them is so far from our minds. And what I want you to see in this is that the, the only way that the Father gives us for us to actually treat our enemies is this, is that we are not meant to be passive, nor are we meant to be vindictive, but we are called to agape. We are called to love. Now, this word can be tricky because normally when we think of the word love, we use the same word to describe the, our love for our kids uh, as we use our love for our wife, as we use our love for our friends, but also our love for our favorite net Netflix uh, binge show that we are watching. But the concept of agape here has little to do with how I feel about somebody. The concept of agape is both an attitude and an action whereby I begin to choose something. I begin to choose to do a deed or an act of love towards somebody, whether they're my neighbor or my enemy. The idea is I don't have to have warm, fuzzy feelings about you to act appropriately toward you. I don't have to have warm, fuzzy feelings about who I think you are for me to actually treat you kind. What I do need to do, I just need to remember what my father is like and begin to trust God to help me to be like my father. And so I want to agape my enemy, but I also want to pray. I want to speak to the father about my enemy. So the, this whole concept is not that we should deny that we are angry, deny that we are hurt. No, the whole concept is that we don't stay in our anger forever. We don't stay in our hurt forever. Uh, that our anger and our hurt is not the end. It's simply a means that we then come before the Lord and we begin to talk to the Father about what has happened to us. We begin to converse with the Father about how we feel and the injustice that has happened. But when we are done, we, we come into the world and we choose to live like our Father, act like our Father through agape. We're not passive, 
as if uh, injustice is okay and we are not vindictive as to retaliate and take justice into our own hands in our own way, taking from others more than what they've taken from us. We're agape. We're living in the tension of doing justice and loving kindness whilst being humble before the Father. Romans 12 puts it this way. Paul is kind of elaborating on the same thought and he says, never pay back evil with more evil. You see, the idea, when evil happens and we use our power to do more evil, the reality is the power of evil, the power of chaos has extended. We are falling outside the line of our Genesis 1 and 2 mandate. We are falling outside the line of the idea that this kingdom we're in calls us to actually go into the chaos, the brokenness, the evil of the world and create good, create for the good of others. He continues to say, do things in such a way that everyone can see that you are honorable, that, that we as people of the kingdom live as people who are honorable. And he's going to show us what this means. He says, do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. He, he's, he's appreciating that there are realities where peace is hard to come by. But have you done everything you can? to turn the other cheek, to find equality, to give an option for others to act differently. Now, what I need you to understand is this. Matthew 18 tells us that when someone has done something wrong to you, go and engage them. If they don't want to listen, bring somebody else. If they continue to not listen, bring elders of the church. If they continue to not listen, you know, bring them before the community of the church. Watch. What's happening in Matthew 18 is that if somebody refuses to do justly, we don't go back to them alone. We, we are never found alone with them again. We, we bring other people an appropriate means of dealing with the problem. Why? Because um, uh, we are not called to be mistreated and then just act like nothing has happened, as if we, we allow there to be no boundaries in the name of love. No, what we see in Matthew 18, there are appropriate boundaries to deal with people who've done wrong. We, we want justice, and when people are saying they don't want to give justice, we are still giving them opportunities to turn. But we are doing and giving those opportunities within boundaries that are appropriate. Paul continues to say, dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. Consider that God's anger is not malicious, is not vindictive, is not passive. His anger is righteous. It seeks justice. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge and I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, watch. Okay, here's what the honorable people of the kingdom do. If you walk around and you find an enemy hungry, what do you do? You feed them. If you walk around and you find an enemy thirsty, what do you do? You give them something to drink. If you are walking around and, and you do this to your enemy, the Bible says in doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. How do you know that evil is conquering you? It's when Bitterness settles in your life. It's when you live your life making every excuse in the world why you cannot forgive. And don't misunderstand the idea of forgiveness. The idea of forgiveness frees you. The idea of forgiveness does not mean that the other person gets away scot-free. What, what, what it means is you are free. But Evil begins to conquer our soul when we become bitter, when we choose to live in resentment. We begin to self-destruct and self-destroy. This kind of kindness, this kind of loving our enemies is so profound 
that in uh, the mid 300 after Jesus's uh, death and resurrection, the last Roman emperor in the Constantine uh, dynasty uh, penned these words. He, he, he wanted to bring paganism back, but so many people were going to the church instead of the pagan temples. And he was so frustrated. And, and here's what he wrote. Consider what he's saying about these people of the way, these Christians, these people of the kingdom, who seem to be loving their enemies. Watch what he says about them. He says, let us consider that nothing has so much contributed to the progress of the superstition of the Christians as their charity to strangers. I think we ought to uh, discharge this obligation ourselves. Establish hospitals in every place, for it would be a shame for us to abandon our poor while these Galileans or Christians provide not only for their own poor, but also for ours, welcoming them into their agape love. They attract them as children are attracted with cakes. It was, it's this kind of love that brought change to a whole nation. Lastly, we need to observe our enemies. Here's what it says in, in Matthew 5. It says, um, if you love those who love you, you're not any different than tax collectors. Now, tax collectors were the most corrupt in the minds of the Jewish people. And it says, if you greet those who are your own brothers, you, you, you are exactly the same as the pagans. This was not used as a derogatory term then. It was used to kind of give this idea that these guys, don't, they don't worship our God. So, so you need to, when you have an enemy, you need to observe the enemy. And, and you need to see that, oh my, I act like the enemy I hate. Uh, I only love those who love me. And I only greet those who greet me. And, and, and my life is beginning to take the shape of the thing I'm most focused on, which is my enemy. When I see them, I never greet them. Uh, when I see them in pain, I never show any kindness to them because I am treating them as I think they will treat me. I am not treating them as I would want to be treated. I'm treating them as I perceive them treating me. But you are people of the kingdom. You are different. And Jesus says, don't do that. You must be perfect like your father is perfect. And the word perfect here is not the word holy. The word perfect here is speaking about maturity, wholeness. So the idea is that the people in the kingdom of God who have learned to love their enemies are acting like their father. And in acting like their father, they are acting whole. They are acting mature. I want to read you this last story. Again, it kind of is a, a matching story to the idea of loving your enemies. Jesus knows that the people of the Israelites are completely in hatred with the Samaritans. The Samaritans were a group of people who in those terms would have been termed half-breed. They were a mixture of the oppressors and the Jewish people. Now, that is an extremely derogatory term now, but in those days, that's how they interpreted it. And they were so uh, filled with hatred for the Samaritans that they would wake up in the morning and they would pray a prayer like, Lord, uh, I, I thank you today that I'm not like the Samaritan who will never be in your presence. They, they were filled with so much hatred that they considered Samaritans like dogs. Watch what Jesus then says in Luke 10. 29 to 37. He's speaking to a, a person of the law. Let's assume it's a lawyer. And it says this, but he, not speaking of Jesus, but the lawyer, but he wanting to justify himself, asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Right? He, he wants to justify the people he loves and the people he hates. 
And he says, okay, wait, hold on, hold on. I, I hear you are telling me that I must love the Lord my God with all my heart, but also I must love my neighbor. I hear you summaring all the law in these two things, but who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied by saying this, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by the other side, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. And he went to him and, band and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, that is two months worth of salary, and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the expert in the law replied, watch, the expert in the law does not say it is a Samaritan who had mercy on him. He says the one who had mercy on him. He can't even say his name. That's how much filled with hatred they are towards the Samaritans. And Jesus told them, you go do likewise. This example is so powerful, this parable is so powerful because what Jesus is trying to teach those who are willing to listen is this, is that a Jewish man has been robbed, beaten, bruised, and left for death. And, and the people in the, who are considered to be high in the Jewish community, esteemed, the Levite, the priest, they walk down this dangerous road from Jerusalem to Jericho and they protect themselves. They don't take time to care for him. They protect themselves and they use their power to ensure their own safety. But the Samaritan, who knows this is a dangerous ground to walk in, uses his power, financial, emotional, transport, to serve an enemy. And he cares for him in such a way that he's willing to give two months of rental for this individual and is able to come back and make sure this is actually fully done and paid and he's taken care of. Jesus uses the imagery of an enemy to teach those who are in the in crowd. This is what you ought to do. That they are so desperate to draw lines regarding neighbors so that, they can be, so that they can be allowed and justified to hate the people they want to hate. But Jesus says, no, no, hold on. Uh, your neighbor is anyone on your, on your path. Anyone on your path. And if the person on your path is your enemy and they are in ruins and they are being hurt, you must treat them like they are your neighbor. And the most incredible thing about this scripture that is the greatest motivation for you and I is that Jesus is like the Good Samaritan. He is like the one who on his path laid down his life for us who were laying down on the road, left for dead. And he gives himself and his, his blood is spilt for both the deserving and undeserving. His blood is spilt for both the just and the unjust. Who will your blood be spilt for? Who will your sweat be spilt for? According to the kingdom, is that we not only love agape, our neighbors, but we love and pray for our enemies. So consider with me the cross. When you look at the cross, what do you normally think? 
What we normally think is this, here's the cross, here's what Jesus has done for me. But what the people of the kingdom see when they look at the cross is not only what Jesus has done for me, they see what Jesus has done for my enemies. And they are going to treat their enemies like they were neighbors. Why? Because Jesus made us who were enemies of God. We tend to forget that part. We ourselves were enemies once of God. And he has made us neighbors. And now, because we realize that we were once in Egypt, that we were once enemies, and instead it is God who pulled us into adoption, we ourselves are able to walk into environments where our enemies are present and are able to agape even when we don't feel like it. Because something has happened in our lives that allows the love of God to not allow us to be passive people, but also to not allow us to be vindictive people, but agape people. So, Who's your neighbor? And how are you using your power for them? Lord, I thank you today for your word. It's challenging. I can think of so many scenarios of my own life where this scripture challenges me to the core. But I thank you that you provoke us to good deeds that you refuse to allow us to live the kind of lives where we are oppressed by bitterness, oppressed by hatred, oppressed by unforgiveness, but that we can actually go into the world and have hearts that are at peace and have hands that are active. That we can go into the world and have courage to make things right and yet have the mercy to love kindness. That our justice can smell different, sound different, look different, because we walk humbly before you. Amen. Hey family, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope that that message challenged and inspired you. And that as you consider Jesus' life, but also the cross and his resurrection, you might consider what it means to be a people of a different spirit, following a different king, and called to live lives that are different in this ever-changing world. I hope that you uh, will get plugged into a group but I do also hope that for some of you, as you are listening to this message and considering what Jesus has called these followers to, that you might consider whether or not you are a follower of Jesus. And if that's you and you say, I want to take a next step, uh, let us know. Uh, tell us that, man, I, I actually want to give my life to Jesus. Or maybe you are saying to yourself, I do want to give my life to Jesus, or I have already given my life to Jesus, but I really want to firm up the foundations of my faith. We have what is called our Next Steps class, and I want to encourage you to sign up for it. Let us know you're interested in it. One of our leaders will be in touch with you to help you build a firm foundation as you begin to follow Jesus, or as you continue to follow Jesus faithfully. Now, as we do every Sunday, I want to send you into your world, your family, your workplace, your environment with this blessing. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. And may the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. And I pray that he will give you peace. Shalom. Now and forever. See you next week. Something's been stolen Under the weight of the curse you've been broken You're not what happened You're more than the shame you were recklessly given 
You silently scream through the tears you can't keep from falling. Wishing they pulled out enough to break through the hurting. See you.